Colossians chapter 3. Book of Colossians. Chapter 3. Verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, your life is hidden with God, and when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but <clears throat> Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against, a complaint against one another, Against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God will stand forever. Lord, we thank you for your word, and the opportunity to get together this morning and to look to it and look at it and read it. And I pray that um, you'd open our hearts and our minds and We'd learn, apply, we'd grow because of it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll tell you a, a, a kind of a funny story about when I learned to dance. Um, not that I'm a great dancer, but um, looking around the room, I'm probably better than a lot of uh, you in here. I'll say that much. <laughs> Just joking. I am totally joking. But here's what happened, though. This is kind of funny. So, I was, I, I wrestled at the University of Minnesota. One of my high school teammates uh, wrestled at Harvard. And uh, one of his teammates, the guy has a lot of money, the dad has a lot of money, is flying in the um, retired Olympic coach for the Russian team, which is as big as it gets. And then they flew me in to just train with with this guy and be taught by the coach the whole summer. And I'm like, sweet. I'm going to spend the summer in Boston. I get a great coaching, and I get paid to learn of something I would pay money to do anyways. So I'm there, and I'm hanging out with these guys from the Harvard wrestling team one night. And um, they're like, hey, let's go to this uh, club or whatever and, and whatever, the whole downtown area. And I was like, okay. And I got separated from them. And I found myself in like a, a venue. People are dancing and I'd never been here before. And all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm kind of tired of sitting around watching everyone dance when they go somewhere. I'm never going to see these people again in my life. I was like, I can make a fool of myself and not be embarrassed about it. And that's what I did for like weeks. And I would just, <laughs> I'd go out like covert, like a weirdo, like a weirdo, I guess. Now I think about it and I never thought about it that way. And I just watch people. I'd be like, 
that's pretty cool what they're doing, and then I would go and do it, and it was, it was odd. And, and I realized what I was, I'm just the thief. I was just being a good thief, watching them, mimicking them. I, I, I was just listening to uh, an athlete, that Cristiano Ronaldo, the soccer player, and he said the same thing. He goes, you know, what, what people don't know about me is what I do is I'll, I'll watch somebody do a soccer skill that's way new and different, and I'll stay after practice for an hour and just rep it, rep it, rep it, rep it. I mean, every sport does that, right? Football, baseball, basketball. I, I send, I'll, I'll see a move, a wrestling move, and I'll send it to the twins and say, hey, we're working on this. Watch this. Watch this a bunch because, um, you know, Monday we're going to work on this because we're good thieves. When I was teaching with, uh, on Samson a, a while ago, I, I, I mentioned to you that Chuck Smith um, taught one time on Samson, and there was a section he taught on, and, and, he, and he, he hit these words that sin will bind you, sin will blind you, sin will grind you, and it's, it kind of goes through Samson's life. They captured him, they gouged out his eyes, and they made him work the mill, right? And I always thought, like, man, how did he come up with that? It was so good. And then years after that, I'm reading this old commentary by some guy who passed away in England, and he goes through Samson, and those were the three points he had. And I was like, wow, oh. Chuck totally took that from him. I remember Chuck speaking once. He said, if you teach it once, it's yours. <laughs> it doesn't matter who said it. Because we're all good thieves, right? What about character? What about morals? We are told to, and we are given the reference point of the person of Jesus Christ, and then told to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. That's a lofty task. That's big. And, and that's what Paul's encouraging us to do, and he's laying, out, he's laying it out for us pretty practically this morning. And he's, he's moving the reader now more into applying things that we've learned up to this point. And let's see here what he's doing. Chapter 3, verse 1. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, and, and we've got to pause because you do need to answer the question, have you been raised with Christ? This is present tense. This isn't future. He's not talking about when we get to heaven. He's talking about our minds, our affections, our hearts. Are we moving in that direction? Right? Have you? This is now, and that's a quick decision. It's a, it's a moment of surrender. It's a moment of saying, yeah, I, I, that's, that's what I want. Okay? If then you have been raised with Christ, look, seek the things that are above where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are above. And look, he's contrasting here. Not on things that are on earth. He's, he's saying to take your, your affections off of earthly things and move it upwards. Where are you looking? What is your mind set on? Um, <clears throat> do you know God d d designed you? He invented you. Do you know that? He knows everything about you. Like, you got to really think about it. Like, like go, go all the way back. Like, are you an accident? If you're not an accident, he thought you into existence. Um, he loves you right now just as much as he loved you then, and he will love you. He knew you would walk away from him. He knew you would reject him. He knew that, he, he, that you know what you ought to do, and you don't do it. <laughs> and he still loves you. And he loves you so much, you know, we, we come here because of the cross. 
He, he hates what's bad for you. It's, it's the opposite of him. Um, it's sin, right? He's perfect. He's right. He's holy. He's, he knows everything. He's all powerful. He's all present. Um, he, knows, he knows the best outcome for every circumstance in your life. And he's gracious, and he's merciful. In every situation, he wants what's best for you. And so, I desperately don't want him to change. But he hates sin. And there's, there, there, there's got to be something that's done about it. The Bible calls sins multiple things. You'll hear trespasses and sins. God says, <coughs> Josh, it's a, it's a sin to pick up that coffee cup. And I'm up here and I'm talking and I get animated and I'm thirsty and I take a sip and he's like, Josh, I'm like, oh, oh I wasn't even thinking about it. Or he says, Josh, don't pick up that coffee cup. And I go, oh, yeah? Mm. <laughs> right? I can sin different ways sin means to miss the mark and the mark is God perfect and holy you'll hear transgression I've crossed the line I've trespassed pesha trespass in Hebrew pesha it means a sin that is done out of rebelliousness iniquity You'll hear that. That's one of the first words used for sin. The root word of iniquity is to be crooked or, or bent, distorted. In Hebrew, the, 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 the letter avav, abet, avon. Avav is, is your eye is being opened to something. I see it. Abet, it's a hook. It's bent. Think of a fish hook. Avon means it's multiplying or there's, there's more of it or it's a result of it. So think about this, iniquity. Whatever your eye gets hooked on, it's going to multiply in your life. And then there's going to be consequences for it. Do you get it? What do you set your eyes on? What are your affections set on? What is your appetite on? It's going to grow in your life. Put it this way. Whatever is growing in your life is because your affections are drawn toward that thing. If it's sin, man, that's a problem. Where do you place your eyes? You ever hear that saying, you look where your eyes go? I'm looking at that door. I'm going to go to that door. You look where your eyes go. What were the words he used here? Seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things that are above. And this, is, this is real practical. This is pretty straightforward. What is your mental attention? What is your point of reference? What is your focus? What is your aim? I mean, just think about, what if I've always focused on the negative? Am I going to be a positive person? No. We become what we behold. What if I focus on sin? What if I focus on God's word? What if I focus on allowing my eyes to, to, to get hooked on trash, I'm going to reap a mountain of trash. It's pretty simple. What if I behold the image of Jesus Christ and I make that my goal? Will I be transformed? And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord 
are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It, what he's talking about there in Corinthians is, is Scripture and looking at Jesus Christ through Scripture. And I see the image of Jesus in the Word of God. And it's like looking in a mirror. I have a reference point and I see him. And in that mirror, I see me, and I see my blemishes, and I see, I see my issues, and I see him, and I see me, and I say, Lord, I don't like what I see in me, but I love what I see in you, and would you help me? And he goes, too bad. No. He goes, Yes. Yes. And, and the Holy Spirit comes in me and he starts working on me and pushing me to the image of Jesus Christ. It's crazy. My affections are being transferred from here to there. Why? Because I, I, I seek it. I set my mind there. Verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Look what he said. Christ is not hidden with you. You wouldn't want that. You are hidden with Christ. Much better. Much better. The Bible talks about two kinds of, of sanctification, and that's kind of the big word of what we're talking about. You're being sanctified. You're growing <coughs> from, from this image into the image of Jesus Christ, right? Right? And, and what, what we call it is progressive sanctification. I'm progressively moving that way. There's the image of Jesus. There's my reference point, And I'm moving towards that. And, and things are being stripped away. I'm taking this off. And I'm putting this on. And I'm growing. And I'm moving that way. And then I blow it. And I take a step back. But then I keep moving. And I kind of blow it again. I'm progressively moving towards the image of Jesus Christ. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. But then there's a permanent sanctification that takes place. And it's the moment I see him. Boom. It's like the outside catches up to the inside immediately. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And then he says, and everyone who has this hope in him, what, is, what does that person do? Purifies himself. I am so looking forward to that. I'm purifying myself. I'm trying to work towards the image of Jesus Christ, sanctification. You see? Is the gospel about you? Well, in a sense, it's about you because the gospel is to rescue you, kind of redirect you, and then what? Transform you. Now, the gospel is not about you to affirm you. <laughs> to celebrate you, to accept you. It's not about you in that sense. And so he says, verse 5, to begin to put things off as we move in this direction. We've set our eyes. We've placed our eyes. And we put off. Like a set of clothes. You're going to take the old dirty clothes off. And your, your new clothes are laid out for you, okay? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, <clears throat> impurity, 
passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Passions, that's kind of the physical side of things. Your flesh is drawn towards this thing. And it's a, it's a passion. Your evil desires, that's more of the mental side to this thing. And you can go through this stuff and you're like, yeah, I see it. So I put it off. Verse 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. He's going to punish sin. And again, Avon, it has the meaning of consequences and choices in your life. And, and it's like, I, I can't bear the consequences of my sin. You know, this is the first time that this iniquity word was used in the Bible here in Genesis chapter 4. And it was Cain. He said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. I can't handle the consequences of my sin. It's heavy. Iniquity. I can't bear the consequences figuratively and literally. We, we can't. He couldn't. You can't. So what happens? There's a substitute that comes. Pesha. Remember? That's a Hebrew word um, for sin. Uh, Pesha lamb. Paschal lamb. Passover lamb. It's a substitute. The lamb would substitute for their sins. They would lay their hands upon it. They would sacrifice the lamb. The the, the picture was my sins are being transferred to that lamb. That lamb's going to die for my sin. That's that's Jesus. He is the sub. You can't handle. You can't bear the weight of your sin. And so Jesus comes. It was prophesied. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds are healed. Even the, 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 the rabbis, before they knew, the ones who don't even believe in Jesus, they would say stuff, he was wounded, meaning that since the Messiah bears our iniquities, which produce the effect of him being bruised, it follows that, Whosoever will not admit that Messiah thus suffers for our own iniquities must endure and suffer for them himself. Somebody's going to pay for the sins. When we try to do it ourselves, the Bible says the best you can come up with, the best outfit of righteousness you can put on you know what it looks like it's dirty rags it's gross our <clears throat> that's our best imagine our sinful day-to-day clothes but but jesus took those and he wants to give you something else verse seven in these you once walked when you were living in them, you notice the past tense there? You, you used to be that way. You were. And you got to remember, who's he talking to here? He's talking to people in the church, by the way. Remember? He's, th- th- these are Christians he's talking to. These are people, that, they're, they're, they're on this path of sanctification. It, it's funny to me when, and I get it, because I, I used to think that way. It, but it's funny to me now when people are like, oh, I don't go to church. People are a bunch of hypocrites. It's true. There's a lot. But we're all, because some people are taking some steps back as they're moving forward. And uh, the, my twins are, they want to get bigger and go up and wait to wrestle next year. And so we're going to the gym a lot, Okay. And my body hurts because I'm taking them to the gym. I'm like, what? It's, why do I? The other day, I'm like, I'm like something hurts every day. And I'm like, oh, it's because I'm going to the gym way too much. The gym, it, it's there to take unfit people and make them fit, right? It doesn't exist to sustain someone where they are at. It's there to transform them. It takes a soft person 
and makes them more fit. Both are there, the soft and the fit. You get it? So I don't go there and look at someone who's out of shape and be like, oh, this place is full of hypocrites, right? I don't do that. There are people in this church who've just showed up. There are people in this church who've been here for a long time. There's people in this church who who are just starting on this path of sanctification, and there's people who've been on there for a long time. We're all part of the process, right? The image of Jesus Christ. We're moving in that direction. We see him. We mimic him. Verse 8. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. None of these things are befitting of a Christian. Anger and frustration are quick to give power, but they also unbalance you. Ahsoka Tano, very famous Jedi Knight. <laughs> if anybody caught the reference. Anger, it's kind of funny. It's an emotional punishment. You give it to yourself because of somebody else's behavior. It's kind of weird if you think about it. Oh, I'm so angry because of what they did, but I'm punishing myself. But that's what comes out of me. If I take an orange and I squeeze it, what comes out of the orange? Orange juice. If I take an apple and squeeze it, what comes out of the apple? Apple juice. If I take an apple and squeeze it, will coffee ever come out of that apple? No. What happens when you get squeezed What happens when someone comes at you a specific way that I can't take it when they do that and you get pressed, what comes out of you? That's that's what we're talking about here. These are things that like it's in me and it's like, Lord, I want to give you that. We get so caught up and, and it's like, oh, they need to change, they need to change, they need to change. But, but, I, but I feel like, you know, everyone else should be fixed. But I have to actually start with fixing the inside of myself first. And that comes by me taking this stuff and putting it off. Verse 9 again, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self. I'm taking it off with its practices and have put on the new self. Watch this. Which is being renewed. This is a process and knowledge after the image of its creator. Again, we have this mirror. And we're like, that's what I see. That's what I want. That's what I want to grow towards. I want to take that and apply it to my life. I want to get rid of this. Verse 11 Here there is not, and and this isn't for only a certain group of people. It's not Greek or Jew. It's not circumcised or uncircumcised. It's not barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, whatever. But Christ is all and in all. This is for everybody. The image of Jesus Christ is set before it, and what do we do? We are to grow in that. How? We spend time in his word, right? Right? I gave you this a couple weeks ago. Read the Bible at a chosen time each day. Read the Bible while you may. Do not start until you pray. Ask, what does this passage say? Look for him who is the way. Find a lesson for today. Pray once more and go your way. That's a great little poem. Read the Bible. I pray, I read. I look, at, I look for Jesus, I pray, thank you, Lord. Prayer is important. We're being formed into the image of our creator. Do you know, do you, do you ever think about when you close your eyes and pray, you are talking to the creator of the universe? That blows my mind. The creator of the universe who wants you to grow into his image. He's on your side. 
and we neglect prayer. That's crazy. Fellowship. I was just talking with somebody yesterday, and we were, the word, they were like, what's that, what's that word in the Bible? Fellowship. I need to do that more. And it's like, yeah, we all do. There's a study in Harvard. This guy, Dr. David M. Cullen, he, he, he did this study for over 25 years. He studied this stuff. And it was about someone who is successful. How do they succeed in life? How do they do it? What do they do? And this is what he said. I, 99% of the time, I can, I can pinpoint it based upon what he calls their reference group. He said, if I see who they habitually associate with, I'll basically be able to tell you. He said, not only that, 85% of the time, this also is, it determines their happiness. Who do you habitually associate with? Who do you surround yourself with? He said changing someone's reference groups will also change at times what the way they think and the way they behave. He said we're like chameleons. You know, we, we absorb things through the skin. Attitudes, opinions, behaviors, world views. We're like a thief. Positive people, upbeat people. Guess who they hang out with? Positive and upbeat people. The same is true for negative people. You, you choose who you hang out with. You become like who you hang out with. What's that saying? Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Right? Well, this is nothing new. This reference group. What do we call it? What does the Bible call it? Fellowship. It's important to be with other people who are on the same path. I am trying to be sanctified into the image of Jesus Christ. So, so, so do you? Oh, you have the same struggles as I do? Yeah. So do you? You have the same questions as I do? Yeah. But do you see the same reflection in the mirror? Yeah. Do you want to look like Jesus? My advice is hang out with him and hang out with other people who are, who are putting on the same set of clothes. They're walking in the same shoes as you are. That's fellowship. The, the challenge to you is, yes, read your Bible, pray. But when do you fellowship? Is that important to you? Is it a priority in your life? So, so we take off the old dirty clothes and we put on new clean clothes. Look at verse 12 with me. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. And here's what you put on, a compassionate heart. Do you naturally have a compassionate heart? You might, you might not. Did Jesus? Yeah. Lord, give me a compassionate heart. Kindness. Lord, help me to be more kind and reflect you in what I do. I was not kind. <laughs> I was not kind right there. I recognize that. I don't know what just came out of me. I'm, I, am, I am sorry. Will you help me to be more like you? Humility, meekness, patience. You know what meekness is? Meekness receives injury without resentment. Meekness receives praise without pride. Get this. Jesus did not describe himself except one time. He said he's meek. Um... And, and he said, he'll, he'll, 
He'll yoke up with us. This is a yoke, right? They would take an older ox and yoke it to a younger ox, and the younger ox would learn the ways of the older ox. Pace yourself. Don't, don't lean one way or the other. Don't burn out. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Look, take my yoke upon you. Look what he says. And learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Meek. That's the word. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You don't have to steal it, by the way. (laughs) He'll just yoke with you. Two oxen are chosen to share a yoke. The first is an older, seasoned ox. He's trained. He's hardy from years of routine. The second is a new, young ox. He has potential, but he is inexperienced. And by sharing the same yoke with the veteran, the elder trains the younger. Not only that, the experienced one draws harder to bear the majority of the load. Since the older one leads, the younger ox does not have to wonder what to do. He learns from his mentor. He gains the knowledge and skills to teach others. And this this is discipleship. Jesus invites us to learn of him. It's another way of saying, hey, be my disciple. There's peace and not having to figure everything out on your own and just saying, Lord, I just want to follow you. There's assurance as we follow his lead. Jesus also says his yoke is easy. The word easy here, it doesn't mean simple. It means good. If I'm yoked to Jesus, there's peace in being yoked to someone who's good, who's loving, who's patient. If you want to get faster, you have to run with people who are faster than you. Right? That's what's happening here. Verse 13, bearing with one another. Did Jesus bear with other people? It means put up with other people. (laughs) This person bugs me. (laughs) Put up with them. Why? Because Jesus puts up with you. Do you think you're annoying sometimes? If you don't, I'll tell you on the way out. There's a few of you. Okay, I've I've already planned on telling you, just so you know. No, we're to bear with one another. They're on the same path. Bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive. If you have a hard time forgiving, that's not Christ-like. Some of us keep record of wrongs. We harbor bitterness. And it's like, life is, first of all, life is too short to do that. (laughs) It's just not not good for you. But did Jesus keep a record of wrong against you? No. If you forgive a person and you hang on to anger, pain, hurt, that's not forgiveness. If you hang on to that stuff, actually, you don't understand what forgiveness is. How are we supposed to forgive? Like Jesus. What did Jesus do? Forget it. I forgive you. It's over. How do I learn to forgive like Jesus? I get to know him. How do I get to know him? Through his word, through prayer, through fellowship. Verse 14, and above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. By the way, do do I, if I want to, do I have to stop blank before I become a Christian? No, that would be like saying you need to get cleaned up before you take a shower, okay? You just come to him, and he's like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. We'll yoke up, and we'll move forward together, okay? Verse 15, let the peace of of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful To, to rule in your hearts means to, like, judge in your hearts. And judges, 
They're supposed to be impartial. I'll even show you what a famous judge says about this, which is kind of ironic. Important to stay impartial. That's the nature of the job. Unhook myself from my emotional responses. Stay within the unemotional objective persona. And this is to the Constitution, right? Because they're a judge. This process can be very weighty at times and very awe-inspiring in others. So do my are. <laughs> but that's what a judge's job is. And as the peace of, of Christ begins to rule in our hearts, he's like, that's out. That's in. And he's impartial. Josh, that's out. But I love it. Josh, it's out. And that's in. Why? Because our reference point is the image of Jesus Christ, and we're moving that way, and I'm not going to get emotional about this. You get it? My, I, am, I am to give you peace. I am to guard. I am to judge. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, give, thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. Uh, ironically, this is um, one of the, when I, when I was kind of coming back to the Lord in my own personal life, this was one of the first verses I memorized. I don't know why. I must have been reading through the New Testament and come across this and it jumped out to me. But I, but I love it. You know, in the preschool or in, um, well, in school in general or or, or developmental classes, a lot of uh, transitioning from one environment to the next, what do they use? Songs, right? Why? Because it kind of helps you to think through something, to move on to the next thing. It's, it's pretty important. And um, it's also a, a way to get something deep in you. You ever, you ever sing a song and you're like, where did that come from? <laughs> like, and sometimes it's not good, but sometimes I remember, again, at that same time in my life, I remember songs I learned from a little boy, usually psalms that were scripture songs, and they just started popping back in my mind. I'd be walking to class, and all of a sudden I'm singing a song, and it's a scripture song. Um... And you're giving, you're giving this stuff a place to dwell so it's at home. Why is it important that God's word is in our hearts? It's, it's for ourself. It's for others. And it gives us a, a place of thankfulness like, Lord, I want to keep moving in this direction. Um, we have a lot of flaws. We're not perfect. But we have a lot of blessings. And so we have to be grateful. Verse 17, last verse here. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, look what he says, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We have to be thankful. Um, I just, we were reading Tozer, the, the leadership here. We just finished a book by A.W. Tozer. And in the last chapter, he says, look, this is our problem. People compartmentalize things between the sacred and the secular, and they don't allow these two to cross. They say, well, this is my life in the secular world, and I just leave it here, and then I, I take that hat off, and I put it there, and then I put up my church hat, and now this is the sacred. And, and he says, no, you can't compartmentalize. You know, guys are really good at that. I get home from work. How is work? Good. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> or like, how is that? Good. I'm fine. I'm, I'm in this box right now. I'm not thinking about that stuff. I'm in this one, right? We do that. But we can't do that with, with, with our Christianity and our character and being the image of Jesus. I'm not the image of Jesus Christ. I'm not moving towards the image of Jesus Christ here, but then I take that hat off. I'm like, no, I'm going to party. Yeah. You can't do that. doesn't make any sense. That's called hypocrisy. That's putting a mask on. I'm going to put this mask on, and then I'm going to put this mask on. I can't do that. So I grow in my relationship with the Lord. Which one 
do I feed? I, I move towards the image of Jesus Christ through the Word of God, through prayer, through fellowship. I, I repent and I remove those dirty clothes. In repentance, I'm agreeing with God. I agree with you. This has to go. This must be permanent. You know, my flesh is crafty here. My flesh might feel bad. It might feel sorry. I want to feel better, at least for a couple weeks. Re repentance is releasing and agreeing with God. Regret. That's my flesh. That's just temporary. Don't confuse the two. We repent to be forgiven, and we repent in order to surrender and say, Lord, I need you. I want to be changed. Take me, break me, mold me, shape me, transform me into the image of Jesus Christ. He came to carry our consequences. He bore what we could not bear so we could walk. He bore the consequences of our iniquity. Last thing. Do you remember there's this interesting parable in Matthew 20, 22 that Jesus told. And, and it's about this guy. There was a wedding feast and all these people were invited and some showed and some didn't. But this one guy was in there and, and he showed up and he had the wrong set of clothes on. And they're like, get him out of here. <laughs> you remember that one? I remember reading it the first time. I'm like, what was that all about? Well, in that culture, to go to a wedding, you would wear your finest. And if you didn't, a lot of times you would show up in the in the and the wedding party would have clothes for you to wear. And, and this guy in the parable, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to keep his own dirty clothes. And the host said, you can't do that. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. He did it. He will do that for you. He will take that dirty set of clothes, the best you can muster. He will take it and he will give you a set of clothes that are righteous and perfect and holy. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Jesus died to clothe me in garments that I could never produce on my own. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, the bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And this is the church. And look at that word, granted. They're given to you freely. You don't have to be a good thief to get these clothes. You just ask. You spend time in his word. You talk to him in prayer. And you fellowship with other people who are on the same path, in the same shoes, the same pair of socks, the same t-shirt, and we move together forward. Lord, thank you for your word and the opportunity to get together this morning and to look to it. Lord, we pray that um, you'd help us to just grow with you, grow in our relationship with you understand you more, understand ourselves more, but to just be able to represent you. I pray you'd help us to do that, and I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Next week, we'll pick it up right where we left off here. I want to remind you that throughout the course of the week, there's lots of studies and uh, groups you can get involved in. Uh, you know, we're speaking about fellowship and things like that, and, and speaking of prayer as well. 
I want to remind you right now, there'll be people up here to pray with you. If there's something we talked about today where you're like, I want to pray about that, or there's something else going on in your life, or, or you want to pray for somebody, come forward and, and, and pray with us. That's what we want to do. Otherwise, I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. I pray that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. 